Welcome. The following video or audio are the study of the Bible, chapter by chapter, verse by verse of the King James 1611 Bible. Our family welcomes you to our household Bible ministry time. You may watch and listen with us. Our goal has been from Genesis to the book of Revelation. Each chapter by chapter we try. And topical preaching and teaching aids you can find by searching different topics. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly divine the word of truth. Come and appreciate the word of God for our spiritual growth, our development in the word of God by these lessons. Please feel, feel, please feel welcome to upload and share our Bible study with family and friends. Like us, subscribe, write a comment, let us know you heard the message. The video or audio are not copyrighted and should be used and not abused. Thank you. Second Corinthians chapter 13. This is the third time I am com coming to you. So two other times Paul has visited this church. He's presently thinking about the third time. In the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established. Now this is taken right out of the law. Now this, what the law here states, the fact is that you can't put anybody before a court, before a judge, with one witness. Minimum of two people. Three or more would be best. And Paul is saying, listen, I'm taking that law and I'm applying it to my visit in your church. Excuse me. So Paul, in relation with the Corinthian church, he is running to the law saying, hey, I'm a witness of what's going on there. First and second Corinthians. It's not a fable story tale of sins. I've been there all speaking. And I'm writing these letters to the testimony. And we have one back here in first Corinthians. Let's see if I can find it real quick. Uh... That's one place in First Corinthians. He gets a report. First uh, Corinthians one eleven. A house of Cleo, C H L O E. They tell Paul. <clears throat> so when we're looking at the sins of a church and the sins of the church, Paul stands to the fact is, I've been there twice. I'm coming for a third time. The third time will state a true biblical foundation of a witness of what you guys are doing and what you're not doing. I told you before and foretell you. I've told you past. I'm going to tell you now in the future. As if I were present the second time. And being absent now, I write to them which heretofore have sinned. All right, I'm not there in the corner of the church, Paul speaking. I'm writing to you, to those people who are sinning. And I've told you before. I've told you uh, now. I'm telling you in letters. I'm directing those people that are sinning inside the church. Paul is standing firm with sinners in the church and calling them out and rebuking them and edifying them. And he wants the church to be straightened. He wants them to get right. He wants them to repent. That God may be pleased with the church and with the individuals that are sinning. And the sins are found in 1221. Uh shall be well many which have sinned already and have not repented of the uncleanness and fornication and lasciviousness which they have committed. And like today's church, there are people who are sitting in the pews and they're living a sinful life outside church hours, acting as in all holiness when it's time for church. And that's wrong. 
And it looks like even to the fact is even one step beyond going to church and living a sinful life outside of church. It looks like these people are maybe living a sinful life in church also. And I've seen that in a few churches I've been in. You know they're, they're, they're living wickedly. So, Paul is addressing as he closing this letter to the sinners. You got to get right. You got to repent. If you're saved and you're sinning, you're going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ and it's going to burn up wood, hay, or stubble. If you're sinning and it's not under the blood of Jesus Christ, you have never confessed Jesus Christ as your Savior, you're going to burn in hell where Christ paid for those sins. Notice he said repented 1221. You gotta repent. You gotta get right. Even saved. You gotta get right. First John 1 9. Go check that one out. First John 1 9. Go check it out. I'm gonna leave that one up to you to check out. So I write to them which hereto have sinned. So part of this writing. And maybe it, it, not just this letter, maybe another part of the letter, but he's writing to sinners in this church. He's addressing the sinner. Not just in the pulpit, not just physically. But, and today the church is, what's the, what's the modern church sign? All are welcome. Really? All are welcome? People who lavish and love and boast in sin. You're going to have an openly uh, sodomite who is happy about his, his sin. You're going to let him in the church? You might let him take charge of Sunday school kids and all that? You'd be happy to take somebody who's been de churched because of sin into your church? Yes, that does happen. That is going on in the church today. And they're not rebuking sin. Paul is rebuking sin in this church. And some people probably even say we're going to get, they're going to question Paul. But some people probably even say with Paul would be addressing these people that are sinning in the Corinth church. Who does Paul have to say? What, what, what Paul has to do with people in our church, the members of our church? Who do you think he is? He's the founder of this church, the builder of this church upon the foundation of Jesus Christ. He built this church. And not that, oh, he has authority to do what's going on. He loves these people. He wants them to get right. So, since ye, and he says, I told you before, I foretell you, as if I were present and second time, being absent now I write to them which, there, which heretofore have sinned, and to all other. That if I come again, I will not spare. Ooh, you're in trouble. Paul is warning them. I'm going to come a third time. If I end up coming, you, you're going to get it. I am going to rattle some tables and knock some sheep out of the building. We got some skinny queer preachers in the pulpit today that will not do nothing about sin what would jesus do he tear up the whole temple what would paul do <laughs> i will not spare i don't care who it is i'm going to deal with you since he listen i i, I know a church a guy committed adultery against his wife out out thing Roll the church letter. This family is out of this church. Blah 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 blah. And then you go back and get get something fixed by this guy who had a business. Really? You de church the guy, and then you go back and give him business as a pastor. Really? Come on. So Paul is angry with sinners. So, I will not spare it. Since ye, who the sinners. I just saw that. Just believe it or not, this is the second time we're doing it, thanks to technology and computers. Since ye 
seek a proof of Christ speaking in me. The sinners are saying, well, who, who, who does Paul think he is? What authority does he have to be bawling us out? And that is the natural response for a sinner. See, the natural response for somebody who really loves Christ is they get down on their knees and repent and get it right, even if it's a battle through lifetime. Listen, you got something, a sin, you battle your entire life. You don't ever get to victory, but you are sorry. You, you want to give it up. You you cry, you tears, you, you can't escape it, but you want to. And you truly repent, you've got the godly sorrow. It looks like these sinners here that Paul's addressing, they're like, who do, who do you think you are? I almost said a bad word there. In, and they don't even have godly sorrow, and they don't have worldly sorrow. They're not sorry. There's like questioning the authority of the, of the preacher. So there are three aspects that we can look at as far as uh, a person who sinned. And I'm looking back here for a minute. All right. There's three possibilities. Chapter 7, verse 10. For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation not to be repented of. All right, you're truly, honestly sorry, and you repent with all your heart before God. You have sinned against God, and you made it right, 1 John 1, 9. But the sorrow of the world worketh death. You're sorry because you are caught. Okay? That's the only sorry you are. Oh, Mom, I'm sorry. Don't tell Daddy he's going to whip my butt. Don't tell him. Okay, I won't. Okay. And then next thing you go back and steal the cookies again. You want to see a lot of people who are sorry and who are not sorry? Go visit your local courtroom where you, where you can sit down and watch people stand before the judge all day. Okay? And then there, you got this one here, 13-4. You're guilty. And your attitude is not you're going to repent, not that you're sorry, even a worldly kind of sorry, crocodile tears, but who do you think you are? And these are the people who are in danger inside of a church. These are the people that crept into church and has ruined the Laodicean church age. Because they're the ones that bring the money in and give more to the church. And then they'll turn around and tell the pastor, well, hey, listen, you know, I'll take me and my money and my family and all that. We'll go somewhere else if you don't shut up. And some pastors have to fall on that because that's the only finances they got. Other than that, there'll be a little rinky-dinky church that's just barely surviving as other Bible-believing churches are rinky-dinky, just barely surviving. That's why, you don't, that's why you don't invite the world into the church. That's why you have true Christians in the church. You invite the world in, you're asking Satan in. And the Bible says, many shall grow the broad way, few shall show enter the, the, the straight gate. So if many will be lost and few will be saved, what do you think your church is going to end up years down the road? You're going to have many lost persons in that church, and you're going to have few saved. And if you do have a lot saved, you have anybody saved, then you're going to have saved who are going to be truly repentant and get right. Then you're going to have the worldly Christians who don't want to get right and you got a Corinthian church. It's a mess. Since ye seek a proof of Christ speaking in me. Listen, there's, you may think, I don't agree, agree with you, Tyler, about the worldly people being in churches. You know how many churches are around me right now? In Daytona Beach? You know how many of those churches come knocking on my door? One. The Jehovah Witness is the only person ever that has ever come to my door. I don't want to say for God. For religion. I've never had a Baptist come to my door. I've never had an Episcopalian come to my door. I've never had anybody but Jehovah Witness come to my door and I had to move down south for that to happen. I was 18 years old when I got saved. I've never seen a gospel track. I've never wanted anybody ever pull a Bible to me once. Churches are full of worldly people. I've been, in, I was in a church where the people just came for a meal. 
Okay. I was in a church where they were selling a uh, uh, beer party tickets. I'm not kidding. Keg party. Remember the name? Thank God. I know a church right now is practically next thing to a biker bar kind of thing. I know. Listen, uh, no thing. I know a guy. He's a very boring preacher, man. You walked into his church, it was almost like a mausoleum. I can go on. I visited a lot of churches. But you seek proof of Christ speaking in me, which to you word is not weak, but is mighty in you. So which you word, you word, <laughs> that's a good word. That would mess up your English teacher. Is not weak, but is mighty through you. For though he was crucified through weakness, yet he lived by the power of God. For we also are weak in him, but we shall live with him by the power of God through you. All power comes by the resurrected Christ. Listen, okay, we have crosses everywhere. We come to Calvary, yes, I came to Calvary. I saw the bleeding, dying Savior, amen, glory to God to that. See, I was raised and born a Roman Catholic, Polish descent, a Polish Roman Catholic. Do you know how serious that is? Do you know where the popes come from? They come from Poland. Okay. Every week when I went to Catholic Church, Jesus Christ was on the cross, nailed. There he was. But the blood atonement of Jesus Christ cleansed me from all sins. Amen. According to scriptures. But see, we're not done with the gospel yet. They buried him in a tomb. That means he came off the cross. That's not happening in the Catholic Church. He's still there on the cross. Go to any Catholic Church. He's nailed to that cross still. They buried him. And then he arose again the third day according to the scripture. <clears throat> that rising that we see, that resurrection chapter 13, that sign seals deliver me as a Christian. That's what separates religion from Christianity. I serve a risen Savior that is seated at the right hand of the Father right now. It's complete, scriptural. You say, well, my church, we celebrate Easter and Christ. No, Easter's not Christ's resurrection. Then if you celebrate Christ's resurrection, all right, okay, why is he still back on the cross nailed 365 days of the year in your church? Why is it that, well, I would say what? Half of all the crucifixes that people have as earrings or, or uh, as a necklace. Why is half of them have a body nailed to that cross? That's not Christianity, my friend. That's one third of the gospel. One third of the gospel will get you into hell. You got to have three thirds of that gospel. He was he died. Yes, on the cross. Glory to God, he died for my sins. I didn't have to die for my sins. He was buried. And he arose again the third day according to scripture. And that resurrection is the power of God and no one else but God and Jesus Christ. That power I have in me to live my life for Jesus Christ to do right. So as a Christian... The power is there. Examine yourselves. Whether you be in the faith. Get your eyes off somebody else. Again, they're looking at Paul. Who do you think you are? No. Get your eyes off the guy that has the molt in his eye. Because you may have a beam in your eye. Well, you say, you know, Sally, you judge people and all that. Yes. 
I do. When I go preach on the streets, I'm judging them either they're lost or saved. And I'm judging if they're lost, they need Jesus Christ as their Savior. But I'm not foolish enough to stand there or sit there in my wheelchair and, and preach to them not knowing that, hey, I've got my own sin. And before I do something like that, I've got to get right with God and make sure that my sins are under the blood of Jesus Christ. Like the Lord's Supper. I try to, in my church, before the Lord's Supper, try, hey, you know, confess every sin that I know I've done and make things right with God before I take part in the Lord's Supper. And some people say, well, judge not least you be judged. Well, I've judged myself. I'm a sinner. And I will have wood, hay, or stubble. But most of my sins have been put under the blood of Jesus. He said, well, not all. I haven't confessed them all. There's sins right now in my life. But if I have not repented, if I have not tried to get right, who am I to be looking at another Christian and say, oh, what's your trouble? What's your problem? Who do you think you are? And I may be talking about a Christian who is getting under the blood, who is repenting, who is getting right with God. And if I'm not, well, who am I? See, somebody comes up to you, judge not least you be judged. Don't realize you've got to judge yourself, first of all. You know, a guy goes to a bar and gets drunk. He's got to judge himself if he's capable of driving a car, which he's not. Judge not, least you be judged. Well, hand that drunk the keys and let him go drive with your family on the sidewalk or driving home too while you, before you throw judge not, least you be judged. Judge not, least you be judged. When we judge ourselves, there are idiots presently from yesterday who don't know what a red light means. Come drive down Florida. I've never seen such bad drivers in my life. People are not judging them. They're judging, hey, I'm most important. I've got the right of way. And that's not judgment. And that's what the that's what these people were talking about in court. I don't know if they're saved. I don't know if they're lost. But they are judging other people outside themselves. And they stand filthy with God. Well, let's look at a judgment here. Let's, let's look at this one. Revelation chapter 3. Let's talk about Let's look at the church. Revelation 3, verse 14. And unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful, and the true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would that thou wert cold or hot. So that because thou art lukewarm, neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Because thou sayest, the church is saying, I am rich, increase with good, and have need of nothing, and knoweth, okay, I'm rich, I'm doing great, we're just wonderful, God is so pleased with us. Hallelujah. Here's what God has to say about it. And knowest not that thou art wretched, and miserable, and poor, and blind, and naked. That's a church that's not judging themselves, but they're judging others. What are you doing with people going knocking on doors? What are you doing when people preach on the street? What are you doing passing on those? What would Jesus do? He would judge you. In your wrongness. As these people. Prove your own selves. Get your eyes off, Paul. Know ye not your own selves how that Christ, when Jesus Christ is in you. So they've got to be saved. So the question now, like I said, I don't know if they're saved or lost, but according to Paul, they are saved. Except ye be reptobates. So there are people in this church that are sinning, and it looks like it's open, and they don't care. 
They don't have the mind of Christ. They're just doing. They're doing and showing up for church, thinking God's pleased with them. They're doing the thinking they're doing God's service by being there in the church. But they're wrong. And let, let's let's take that wrong one more step. It's called sin. Let's not disguise sin as other words. It's sinning. But I trust that ye shall know that we are not reprobate. Listen, Paul, me and his company, we're repenting. We're getting right. Our lives are pleasing to God. Yours is not. Now I pray to God that ye do no evil. Knock it off. That's what repenting is. Don't do it no more. Not that we should appear approved. Don't put on a, 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 a image of, oh, look at me, I'm holier than baloney. No, you're holier than Swiss cheese. But that ye should do that which is honest. Repent and do right. That's honest. Though we be as reprobates. I don't understand that. Though we be as rep. Why would Paul say that unless it's a sarcastic remark? Oh, you know, we're the reprobates you guys are calling us. For we can do nothing against the truth but the truth. Paul and the apostles. And those that are the missionary teams cannot fight against the truth, but live the truth. Because if they didn't do the truth, they wouldn't be in the positions they would be in. Yes, there are false apostles out there. But Paul, Peter, John, James, and all them are not false apostles. So they are doing and living the truth, and you're questioning their ability. Meanwhile, your, the sinners, <clears throat> are not doing the truth. It's the pot calling the kettle, you know. For we are glad when we are weak, and ye are strong. And the apostle Paul, we read through the previous chapter, all the perils that he went through. The, the Corinthian church suffered, but they didn't suffer as much as Paul suffered. And Paul's weakness, he looked at those Christians like, okay, they're growing. They're doing right. And Paul's like, yay, that's great. That's a great testimony in my life. And this also we wish, even your perfection. Paul says, okay, growing strong, getting right to perfection. But you got to judge yourselves to get to that perfection. You got to look at your life. You got to look at your sin to get to perfection. Never mind anyone else. Therefore, I write these things being absent. 2 Corinthians. Paul wrote this book. I write these things. This is an epistle that Paul has written. And he's not there. Least being present, I should use sharpness. If I was there, guys, what do you say over here? He said, I will not spare, verse 2. If I was there, I'd be sharp. I'd be strong. I wouldn't water it down. According to the power which the Lord has given me to educate. Man, is the power that God has given me that your life will be edified? I will give you hell fire preaching, banging on the fist on the pulpit, it's telling it straight as it is in your face. The kind of preaching that people hate. Again, as we studied Corinthians, both first and second. Paul would use simple, non-educated, hard words. They would be simple to understand words. And he would do it in the power of Christ for that they're ever the case. They will get right. They will do right. They will be pleasing before God. And not to destruction. The message that Paul would give would, would not be 
See, edification is for them to get right. Destruction for them, they won't do right. And they'll lose rewards. Destruction. Wood, hay, or stubble, it burns up. But Paul's message would not be destroyed. If he edified them right, even in sharpness with the power of God, his message would still be approved of God. If they if they rejected and did not do. Now the result of Paul, if he were to preach this sharpness with the power of God, there could be two possibilities. They they were edified, got right, and repented. God be the glory. They would not repent. They will not do what God wants them to do. It would be wood, hay, or stubble. It would be loss, destruction, ashes. And as far as the message, Paul would be preaching the power of God, of the sharpness of the, it would be to God glory. Hey, he preached right. And there would be no destruction of the message because it was in the power of God, what God wanted those people to hear for Paul. Paul would not lose wood, hair, stubble. So you got to realize the message from a preacher has fourfold. It's, to the people for one either get right two just reject it for the for the men preaching the message it's did god approve of that message for edification or was that message you know totally out of order not been prayed about had nothing to do with god or anything like that and to the destruction of the message would hair stubble Edification pleases God. Destruction results in ashes at the judgment seat of Christ. Finally, brethren, farewell. See you later. Be perfect. Be of a good cheer. Be of one mind. Live in peace. And the God of love and peace shall be with you. Close in the prayer. After blasting the sinners, well, farewell. Be perfect. Repent. Remind you. Hey, I'm closing the line. Remember, be perfect. You got to repent to be perfect. Live in peace. Get rid of those sins. Be in good unity with the church. Greet one another with a holy kiss. <clears throat> that was almost like, you know, if there's any uh, conflicts, if there's any battles among the church members, greet one another with a holy kiss. You know, put those problems and troubles away. Get back to unity. Get back to love. All the saints salute you. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Ghost, Trinity, Lord Jesus, God, the Holy Ghost. There's the Trinity. Paul acknowledged the Trinity. Be with you all. Amen. Now, the conclusion of this letter, you know something about this letter this and Ephesians is another uh, I believe the two epistles of Paul he does not list the name of people you know other letters uh, a slew uh, Aquilius and, and Priscilla this gentleman who was a fellow prisoner this one who was a fellow servant salute the family of this the house of that and second Corinthians and Ephesians don't have this list of people he slams them about sin. Then finally, brethren, <laughs> farewell. I don't want to draw any conclusion. I just wanted to make that note. He does not close. It. He, he, he's rebuking them with their sin. And he's like, finally, finally, brethren, good one. Uh, very well. See ya. I don't, want to, I don't even want to write any more or something like that. He doesn't include people's names. That's an interesting little thing there. Maybe he doesn't want to, you know, get, he maybe wants to leave the impression that, hey, you got to deal with your sins. Never mind the people. Never mind grief. You got to deal with your sins because he says, following brethren, farewell, be perfect. The only way to be perfect is you got to repent and get right. Be of good comfort. Good comfort is when you're living right with God. Be of one mind, unity. You can't be of unity with somebody when this group is sinning this group is not sinning this group is sinning but they're confessing they're they're battling their sins this group you know it's not unity live in peace you can't live in peace when you're doing wrong 
And the God of love and peace shall be with you. The God going to be with you in your sins? No. So Paul concludes with the fact is, get right with God. That's what we need to do. We're all sinners. 